Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for coming in this uh, terrible night. Yeah, I can't we blame. Um, I'm absolutely delighted um, to have Joan over here tonight. Uh, I've known Joe for a long time, never met her, but uh, we've, we've communicated for, for a long time. And she is a force to be reckoned with down under in Australia. She's a kind of one woman GWPF. <laughs> 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 and uh, so she has this wonderful blog where everyone who is interested in climate energy issues um, talks and discusses. And she um, updates everyone. And uh, she's a science writer with a science degree. She had, I think, a science program on television. A kids TV show in Australia, yeah. yes. So she's very well versed with the scientific debates, particularly on climate energy, and it's a delight to have her. And she's been to Munich and to Oslo, and tonight she's in London. So please welcome Joan Oba. Thanks very much to my other half who makes it possible for me to be here because he's looking after the kids. And credit to him because he's an electrical engineer and very handy on the science debate when I need some extra information or double checking. Ladies and gentlemen, for a hundred years we had good grids in Australia. <sighs> Bountiful, reliable electricity at 10 cents a kilowatt hour type stuff that was bought fresh fruit and lovely ambient temperatures to us, clearly it was time to do something different. So we are. It takes a lot of, good mo a lot of money though to destroy a perfectly good grid. It's harder than you might think. So it's, you need buckets of cash and you have to overcome the free market, completely bypassing the forces of independent competition because they will foil you at every step if given half a chance. So, you might be thinking though, why? Why? Why do this? And that's why I'm here to tell you and talk about the joy of blackouts. <laughs> because, ladies and gentlemen, the blackouts are really handy for all kinds of things. They can be fun and we find out maybe nine months later how much fun. <laughs> it can bring people back to an experience closer to nature. You know, reminding us how much we don't like being cold or hot, cold and hungry and all those things. It's therapy for screen addicted kids and... We've got two and a half of those. It's great for observing stars. If you get a blackout, of course, it's the only time you get free of light pollution for astronomers. The only time they can work like that, as long as they charge their batteries beforehand and put kerosene in the lamps. Yes, it's perfect for wood-fired telescopes. Yeah, well, you've got to be silly about this, yeah. And, of course, the best reason of all, uh, blackout is the only 100% antidote to the BBC. <laughs> yes, and the only time that it's unbiased, yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, oh, oh, well, this is, sorry, this is from a different presentation I give on ancient uh, pagan uh, symbols. <laughs> Oh, I'm going backwards. Well, that's kind of like Australia. Um, the challenge here, the challenge is harder than you think to destroy a perfectly good grid in Australia. <sighs> because we've got way too much coal, and coal, of course, being 3% of our GDP, we export about $50 billion worth. It's the largest part of our electricity supply comes from coal, and it employs about 50,000 people. And we are the largest exporter in the world of coal. About a third of the world trade is something we've dug out, which is actually a bit misleading because the truth of it is China, you can see um, here, China's got, uh, they, they're digging out seven to ten times as much coal as we are, but they don't export any. They use it all themselves. Whereas we, small nation, we dig up lots and then we can export it, but actually we're not much at all really compared to what China is doing. So we've got the fourth largest reserves of coal in the world. And um, there's a picture there of, yes, coal exports. Indonesia, interestingly, is second to us and sometimes they pip us, but mostly we win that race. 
Um, oh, yeah, uranium. That's us up the end there in the number one position in Canada and Kazakhstan next. So we have the largest reserves of uranium in the world, also adding to the challenge of having expensive electricity. We solve that, though. I'll just show you how um, much uranium we have. It's a bit ridiculous, isn't it? Um, we solve that problem, though. There are 450 nuclear power plants in the world, and we have none of them. So that's how we make sure it doesn't give us cheap electricity. <laughs> we dig it up and send it away, though, and that's... Uh, I don't try and figure it out. Thorium. We don't even talk about thorium in Australia. Most Australians couldn't spell it, probably, but it's... I, I don't mean that in a mean way, just we never talk about it. it it's not a bit, you know, thorium, who's heard of thorium? Um, we've got the largest reserves of thorium apparently too. I'm not sure if we just are God's gift to resources or whether we're simply really good at exploring and we've found it before everyone else did. Um, electricity prices in Australia were falling. That's the graph that starts in 1955 through to about 1995 and you can see for 40 years, electricity prices were falling in Australia as our engineers got better at doing <coughs> things and made the system more efficient, just as we would expect the free market to. Well, we had to do something about that. <coughs> we were the cheapest, amongst the cheapest group, electricity-wise, back in 1995. There we are. And yes, our achievements so far in wrecking our grid are like this. Here we go. This is one graph of electricity prices. They do change a fair bit, but South Australia is up there, New South Wales, Queensland and Victoria, all stellar achievers. And the losers down this end of the scale, <laughs> who just haven't got their act together as far as prices go, are countries like the US and Estonia, Hungary, Lithuania, Poland. Uh, now, I could go through them all if we had time. They are, um, the one common factor with all of them is low wind power penetration in terms of their grid funny thing you it's all that cheap cheap and free electricity you'd think those countries would have more of it but it doesn't work like that um and here in australia you can see from 1995 we joined our grid into a national grid which was a great thing to do because you really can't destroy a grid if it's not nationalized and organized under big government so they joined it there and then we started to bring in renewable energy uh, the intermittent kind from about 2005 slowly, but that probably has nothing to do with it, Riv, just a coincidence. But <laughs> okay, that mysterious price rise at the end. Let's have a look at the kind of electricity generation we were using back in the day, back here, when we had cheap electricity. Now, back then, as you'd expect, all that free wind and solar, lots and lots of free wind and solar, and um, you can see, well, there was a bit of coal, uh, there was a bit more coal, that's the black, uh, brown sort, the black sort, <coughs> And we had some gas and, whoops, I got too jumpy with that, hydro. And the wind and solar back then is all marked in fluorescent iridescent green. Exactly. Exactly. Now you can see here, it's feeding in that little bit of, of um, wind and solar power. It's still small. It's amazing how little it takes to really wreck a grid. So this is wind. That colour there, this is uh, rooftop solar, which you can see is really <coughs> starting to kick in now. And the rest of it's all, that's all fossil fuels. And um, the, let's see, there's big solar in the yellow. It's hard to see it, but there's spots there, 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 and there, which is big solar, as in those giant thermal kind of salt blocks and whatnot. We didn't have much of that. We're getting lots. It's just starting in Australia now. <sighs> More fun to come. Uh, it's been very successful at creating jobs, our renewable transition. Unfortunately, most of those jobs are in places like Haiku and Heng Shui. Yes, it's good for Chinese, not so good for us. This is last December. Things have changed since last December. But back then, um, it's just showing the solar here in... Uh, oh, no, that's gas. Solar's the orange, so the colours are very hard to see on this. But they're still not that big. But the, we've got a 56,000 megawatt national grid on the east coast. Of that 56,000, 6,000 at the moment is intermittent wind and solar. December then was only 4,000. So we've gone from four to six in the space of a year. In the third quarter this year, we added something like 1.2 gigawatts or 1,200 megawatts of 
unreliables to our grid in the one quarter just on the, yeah, the death spiral part of the graph. Um, the reason is largely because of this renewable energy target, which started back in 2000 with a conservative government, very small, 2%, but it kept ratcheting up and it's going to keep ratcheting up. We're up to 16% at the moment is our renewable energy target. To make that happen, people have to buy certificates and sell certificates. The government made it law and hence we're getting more and more renewables all the time. And the funny thing is, all of this time, the opposition and others will claim and whine on about how the problem with our prices is because there's no certainty. Because our government has always had this partisan debate about electricity and there's no certainty. And yet, all through this, there's been a relentless rising renewable subsidy running through our grid from end to end day after day that hasn't stopped. So it's the very opposite. We've had absolute certainty of this renewable transition and it's all artificial, totally driven by the RET, the renewable energy target. This is our solar panels. <laughs> Have a look at this graph. That's 2009 and the solar panels on rooftops. This part here, that, that really is the death spiral. And that's because rooftop panels are subsidised about half of the cost of the installation. So it costs about eight grand to put a panel on a roof Four grand of that comes out of electricity bills of everyone on the grid, which means mostly from those who don't have solar panels. So those without solar panels are paying half the cost of the installation of those with it. And when the Australian public finally finds out, because it's buried in their bills, they don't know it, I think they're going to be pretty grumpy. But it's got to the point now where if you can't afford solar, you, I mean, you can't afford not to get it because electricity prices are rising, partly due to solar, and so those without are paying even more than those with. It's, as I said, it's a bit of a death spiral, that one. About a quarter of houses where I live in Perth, one in four roofs has got solar panels on. I think Queensland's even more, so, uh, South Australia's 30%. So it's an awful lot of infrastructure on an awful lot of roofs. Now, uh, look, they've got so much wind in South Australia, I just thought I'd throw this one in. The black parts there are curtailment. They've got so much wind power that actually in the last quarter, the AEMO, our managers of our grid, had to stop it. About 10% of the energy they just had to throw away and disconnect the wind turbines because it was in danger of overdoing the grid. And yet, despite that, we're putting more wind in. Go figure. Um, and to show you how rapidly things are rising, that's 2015 to the last quarter here. Renewables has increased on the uh, eastern grid to the point where it's now for the first time out doing gas power generation, GPG. So the renewables is really curving up at the moment. So a lot of the graphs I show you are easily out of date, but it's very hard to keep up with them because it's changing so quickly. Uh, an old graph, but a goodie of, and you've all probably seen this one, the renewables versus the cost. And that strange coincidence where the more renewables you have, the higher the cost is. Australia kicking above our weight there, getting more bang for our buck out of our renewables. Um, Ewan Mans did a great version of this where he took the hydro out, because hydro is so deceptive since it actually works. So he took hydro out and did this graph, and you can see the line's really tight. So the more wind and solar you have, the more expensive your electricity is. They can even put it on a nice R-squared graph there and predict the price. And um, that was 2015, so clearly Australia is just steaming through the ranks there since then. Um, as I said, it, t it costs a lot of money to do blackouts properly. And in South Australia, it costs 472 million Australian dollars for that blackout. The electricity took, for people want to know how long it took, four or five hours to start getting Adelaide back to power again from a black start. And it took about two days to get right round the point to the next, um, to the far reaching towns on the other side. It took two weeks to get Olympic Dam working again. That's the enormous, like fourth largest mine in the world or something, some huge mine in the northern part of South Australia. Tasmania um, didn't necessarily have blackouts, but it lost its Basslink cable, which cost $560 million. The, that cable under the Bass Strait, 400 kilometres of subsea cable, that. Um, was out for five months it took them to fix it and South Australia, I'll talk more about that later, it cost them $560 million in lost production and other things to solve that one which is curious because it's twice the cost of building a gas-fired fossil fuel plant which they closed about three months before the cable broke. 
possibly there is a God. Okay, I won't talk about these individual numbers because they've changed so much, but basically it was in subsidies about $600 a household. That was a couple of years ago. Now it's probably 800 or more in subsidies to um, help us make this transition. So it's very expensive, but most Australians don't realise how much they're paying. Now, if you want to destroy a grid, the first thing you've got to do is really easy. You just have to relabel things. This, you would think, is an electrical generation, an industrial uh, electrical generator. Instead, you just need to relabel it. So instead of it being an electrical generation plant, call it a global climate controller. Because <laughs> if this plant is really there to change the weather, suddenly electricity gets expensive because it isn't cheap to change the global weather. Um, and you may think this is there to make electricity, but actually it's there to slow storms and to stop floods. And also, well, actually, sorry, sorry, this is the kind that makes the floods and storms and you know, droughts and whatnot. It also makes bearded dragons dumber. And you don't want dumb bearded dragons. So, yes, in other countries they stop floods with levee banks, but instead we're using wind farms and solar panels to stop floods. We'll see how much, it, how lucky we get. I, I just like this photo because I think it looks quite pretty. A Yulon coal plant working very well in Australia. But instead of that, what we really need apparently to change the weather is wind and solar. Now step two is to pick the intermittent, unreliable and inefficient way to change the weather. Because of course we all know that if you really were serious about CO2, you wouldn't do that. You would bring in nuclear plants and you would make clean coal, high burning, the really high temperature burning coal but that's not what they're doing. Um, the answer is to pick the worst way to do it. And then you get things like this. This is a wind graph of Australian wind production just for a month. Pick a month, any month, they all look the same. Um, the average, the black line here is the average. I know it's a bit hard to see, but that's the average of all the wind turbines on the eastern half of our grid, which is 90% of the Australian electrical market. So twice a month, roughly, it goes from 3,000 megawatts to nothing even though we've got all of those wind turbines. Um, the problem is because we get high pressure cells in Australia and then all of the wind turbines on the entire east side of the country all do nothing together. Most of those wind turbines are in, a lot of them are in South Australia and Victoria and the wind generally blows across the country. So when it blows in South Australia, it blows in Victoria and when it doesn't blow in South Australia, it doesn't blow in Victoria. So good uh, system going there. And even with solar, you would think solar would be immune from that. But in Australia, we get cloud banks like this, which is, that's where most of the rooftop panels are in Australia. And um, sometimes they're all covered up. When that happens, we lose a whole gigawatt of electricity off our grid. And to put that in perspective, our national gigawatt requirement on the East Coast is about 17 or 18,000 up to at peak 35,000. That's the daily kind of range and the peak 35,000 is in summer. Remember, we got 56,000 in capacity. You'd think we would have plenty of spare room there, but not. <laughs> and so imagine this, we've got all this industrial uh, infrastructure, all of these coal and gas plants that can run our electrical grid and had did for years on cheap electricity, but Someone thought, mm, we'll make it cheaper if we add infrastructure which only works a third of the time or, and we add a lot of it and somehow that's going to make things cheaper if we have all this infrastructure to make the same amount of electricity. I don't quite see how that works. And then when they'd added all that wind, then they thought they'd add solar which has an even lower capacity factor. So the question is, with so much of this infrastructure sitting still every day, because it's all producing, all of this produces the same amount of electricity that that did. With so much infrastructure sitting still, guys are twiddling their thumbs, those companies who own all that big infrastructure, they're still paying wages, they're still paying capital costs, they still have to do maintenance and the maintenance costs go up because you're running the plant up and down, up and down, up and down. All those costs have increased. The only thing that's gone down slightly is fuel costs, but it means the money's ticking constantly and we think somehow this is going to be cheaper to have twice as much infrastructure to produce the same amount of electricity. Just, but a lot of Australians actually think it will be cheaper because we get the relentless media message telling us 
with wind and sun is free and yeah people believe it sadly okay step three as i said big government you've got to get big government involved if you really want to wreck a grid for 100 years the separate australian states managed their own grids and that was all fine south australia joined the big grid uh, here we got, they got their big interconnector about 1990 Tassie only got their interconnector in 2005, so it's actually quite recent that we joined the whole lot together. This is about 5,000 k's from top to bottom, and I live over here in this smaller grid. It's a two or three gigawatt grid over here. So we got like 22 million people here, 2 million people there, and then about 2 million camels here. So they don't get electricity though. Um, and up here we've got the small grids. Each of these are very little micro grids in each town. So Australia is a perfect test case, we are the renewable crash test dummies, for trying all variations and forms of renewable energy, big and small. And to give you some scale, I just thought I'd graph Australia. I, it, that's a great website called thetruesize.com. You can just grab the country and drop it. And I'm sorry Australia's pink. I'm really sorry Australia's pink. <laughs> I'm trying to change that. Um, to wreck a grid, you need to pick the right person. This is Audrey Zibelman, which Malcolm Turnbull put in charge of our national grid. And she's a lawyer from New York who was going to work with Hillary Clinton, and that was the rumour. And then Hillary hit a bit of a hurdle in 2016, so she needed an out and we were it. Rescued by Malcolm Turnbull. Yes, we got it. And she's made this great statement. I believe we're the last generation on earth who can really do something about climate change, just the kind of person you want managing your national grid. She said, Jim, she says, technology's changed and resisting this change is a little like trying to resist the internet. Because we all remember, don't we, in the 1990s, we had to force that internet transition. Remember, we had to pay everyone to use it because otherwise, <laughs> who would get on the internet? It's just nuts. Yes, we don't have to worry about sacrificing economics, she said, for good environmental policy. We don't have to worry about that if we don't use any numbers. <laughs> Use us numbers. Okay, you've got to cripple the free market, which works against you all the time. What you can't do in Australia is connect a coal plant to a house directly because then things might be cheap. Um, if you're a Chinese cryptocurrency, though, you can do that, uh, especially if you put your within a kilometre of a big plant. You can do a deal direct with that plant and you are not on the national grid, which means you don't have to pay rent certificates and other things like that. So Chinese crypto has done a deal with Red Bank Coal for eight cents a kilowatt hour. The same town, 20 k's away, the news agents are paying 28 cents a kilowatt hour. But yes, the joys of the market. Audrey's big fear, she said this year, was that the big players may leave the grid, leaving fewer customers to pay for the cost. In other words, what's the limit of Australian electricity prices? Well, there is a limit and it's the cost of buying the diesel generator and sticking it in your backyard and how much you get from that. Despite all the savings of a national grid and those enormous coal-fired plants, you, it's hard to beat that kind of economic benefit from grouping it together. But at the moment we are looking at losing people from the big grid who are finding some other solution and the more that happens, the worse it gets for those left behind to pay for the rest of it. If you ask Australians, of course, 99% of them will say, yes, we believe in climate change. But if you ask a different question and say, how much do you want to pay? 62% don't want to pay even $10 a month for renewables. They don't know they already are. It's all hidden in the costs. And these numbers are the same overseas. We've seen 61% of Germans don't want to pay even one more euro cent. And 42% of US adults don't want to pay even a dollar a month to stop climate change. It all depends on the questions that we ask, of course. Uh, this is a great graph from a US group. And in this case, this red part here is the capital cost of a coal plant. So there's the baby coal plant born there at year zero. At age 30, the coal plant is paid off. So that capital cost, this is a dollar uh, cost per megawatt hour. So the electricity costs are sweet here, $30 a megawatt hour, three cents a kilowatt hour wholesale from those coal plants. The best thing you can get in a system is a brown coal plant that's 30 years old. That is just a gift from the last generation who paid it off. So what is Australia doing with those? We blow them up. <laughs> I'm glad our grid is good for laughs. It's gotta be good for something. Um, 
so yeah, this is South Australia. They have actually destroyed some of that infrastructure. We're going to destroy this fairly soon. This was Liddell. It's a coal plant in New South Wales. Uh, the New South Wales state government gave this away along with another coal plant. They literally valued it at $0 in 2014 and gave away a plant which produces about 1.6 gigawatts of electricity. Like a McHappy Meal, just bundled in with another coal plant. The company that bought it now says, well, we're going to shut it in 2022, despite it producing cheaper electricity than a lot of other things on the grid. Our grid, our market is so screwed. They've knocked back an offer from a competitor of a quarter of a billion dollars because they don't want to sell it. It's worth more to them to trash it than to keep it running or sell it for a quarter of a billion dollars. It says something about how really screwed up we've done with this market. That's Hazelwood, which is legendary for being the last coal plant to be shut down uh, about um, early 2017. And when it did, prices rose 85% in Victoria. And I'll show you why. It's to do with our auction system, the way they bid for <coughs> things. These are, that's Liddell, that's Bayswater. So these are all generators and they're bidding into the system the bid price of what they think they can provide the electricity. That's about $20 a megawatt hour. Then you get, once you finish the brown coal, you get the black coal and you get the gas and other things bidding. Now, the way it works is that, sorry, I keep going backwards with this. Um, if that is as much as we need, like 25,000 megawatts or something, they call that the winning bid and then they say everyone gets paid at that price. So all of these others who bid lower will get paid at the price setting bid. So when we shut down one of these or Hazelwood, it shifts the line across and then the winning bid is going to come in up here and it's much higher. So that's why prices could jump so dramatically by shutting just one last coal generator. We have other coal generators. And they're still bidding, but they're not winning the prices anymore. They're not setting the price like they used to. So we can keep going on. You can see why AGL might want to shut Liddell because they also own renewables and gas and other forms of generation. They're all going to be so much happier if they can just get rid of more coal off our grid. So there's yeah, Hazelwood shutting. Brown coal used to set the, um, the, the winning bids after Hazelwood. Nothing. Uh, bl black coal set it more often and black coal is more expensive than brown coal. Okay, signs of success in Australia. Blue Scope Steel, one of our largest steel producers, has had a 93% increase in costs in the last two years. So the numbers are really burning up. And the quote from Bluestone, uh, the head of Blue Scope, is that energy costs in the US were up to 10 times lower than what his company was paying in Australia. So they're looking at moving some production to the US. Um, aluminium, we are the world's largest exporter of bauxite, the, uh, the ore that we get aluminium from, but we're only the sixth largest exporter of aluminium because of course aluminium needs a lot of electricity to be converted from bauxite into aluminium. And it's so bad, uh, we had six, Smelters, now we've got four, and we've got, really got three and a half. One of those smelters in Portland had two pot lines, but they froze solid when the blackout struck for more than three hours. With those aluminium pot lines, you cannot shut electricity unexpectedly for more than three hours. And they're enormous. They, one Tamago in New South Wales uses 10% of New South Wales' grid. It is such a big user of electricity, and New South Wales is our largest industrial state. Okay, so we are advancing right back to uh, the late 1800s and diesel because people are buying their own diesel gems around Australia. Farmers are doing it because they can't afford a blackout unless the frost hits their crop and they don't have sprinkler systems and other ways of stopping it. So lots of people are, the diesel gen guys love it. They're selling a lot of units. <coughs> um, this is an interesting graph that I have not seen anywhere else. And uh, this is our disposable income per capita. And this is way back to 1960. You can see we had a recession here in 1990. That was the worst recession since the Great Depression, and that was the drop. Here, the GFC, and there was a little drop. And then here, something, something strange is going on in the last five or six years without disposable income. So people just don't have the money to go along to the shops to buy stuff in retail and other outlets. It's being chewed up in electricity bills. And um, yeah, you can see the trend there. That was the GFC. Nothing compared to what's happening 
something mysterious now. Um, and you can see here, compared to inflation, this is uh, the inflation basically rising and this is electricity prices just off the charts in terms of after all those years of improving. Um, years ago, it didn't even rise with inflation. The average price is $30 a megawatt hour since 1999 or something like that. That was a huge drought. But when the drought went away, our electricity prices were still about $35 a megawatt hour. That's the carbon tax. And this is some seismic shift that's just shaking out. I think we've hit that critical limit. Um, and you can see in spike prices, we're getting a lot of spikes in our electricity price. The electricity price is capped by the government artificially at $14,000 per megawatt hour, and we do hit it. They hit it in one heatwave weekend in January and it chewed through $400 million of electricity in that two-day heatwave for South Australians and Victorians. $400 million in spike prices for electricity. It's just really scary. Oh yes, more of those spikes. And you can see the whole thing's changed. Our whole market is shifting compared to what it used to be. Something really bad is going on. Now, this is Flinders Island above Tasmania. It is God's gift to renewables. There is no better place on earth, I swear. Uh, at the moment, it runs on diesel gen. They don't have a connection to any good infrastructure, just diesel gens. So renewables are only competing with diesel gen. Wind power is in the roaring 40s. That's what we call the wind there. So that's good news. And tidal has been described as ideal for tidal. Despite that, they're going renewable. But when they achieve 100% renewable, nobody's promising the price is going to be down. So all that intermittent renewables and it's still going to be the cost of a diesel gen and the diesel gens will still be there as the only thing between them and a blackout. So, oh, and since we're talking about Tasmania, let's have some fun. That's the Bass Link cable there that goes underneath the Bass Strait, 400 kilometres of cable that keeps this connected to the mainland. And um, they've got lots of hydro in Tassie. So they were using the hydro when the carbon tax came and selling back to the mainland grid and collecting the carbon credit kind of deal. So back here before the carbon tax, you can see how full the dams were. Then they started to empty the dams and sell the electricity off and collect the carbon credits. And then, oh bum, there was an El Nino, which means not much rain in the eastern side of Australia. And then there was a, a, a double bum, another El Nino. So they got to here, around about there was where they thought that would be a good time to shut their last fossil fuel plant in South Australia. <laughs> One they'd only just uh, built in 2009 for 230 million. They shut it there in about August. Um, bad news for them came when the thing broke in about New Year and they suddenly were isolated, 100% renewable. So for four months, Tassie was 100% renewable, but uh, then they had to chew through their water. They got down to about 13% left in their dams. It was a real crisis. They uh, got flying squads of diesel from South Australia and flew them across to the green state and run off diesel so that they didn't get the lights out. That was a success, they didn't have a blackout. Here in May, they still hadn't fixed the um, still hadn't fixed the cable. They needed 17 days straight or something like that without storms on Bass Strait. Took them five months to get a space and a boat so they could fix it. Here in May, just to show you how good bureaucracy is in Australia, they um, there was this, the dams were filling again because it is the wet season and um, the <laughs> the rain was coming. In fact, a storm was coming, a really bad storm was coming. It was a storm so big, you probably saw photos of it, of pools washed down onto beaches in Sydney. So it came down through Sydney, through Victoria. They had lots of warning. There were flood warnings in Tassie and the water was rising and they said, this is a good time to cloud seed. I kid you not. They sent cloud seeders up in the face of a storm because they wanted more water in their dams so they could make money <coughs> out of that. Just incredible. Yeah, that's the Tamar Valley gas plant built for 230 million and shut down. They reopened that because they had to. So much for being 100% renewable. That's the uh, pool that went missing. That's some of the floods that were coming. Some of the seas, just phenomenal around Sydney. Um, yeah, so they cloud seeded. Cloud seeding to generate electricity. Might be the only case of it in the world where people were using planes to generate electricity. Um, <laughs> Yes. Um, frequency. Have we got engineers in the group here? I'm sure we do. 
Okay, all right, for the benefit of everyone else who's not familiar with how it works, I'll try and be really quick. We run on 50 hertz. I just wanted to quickly show why 50 hertz matters so much. On the grid, engineers get very stressed if it drops below 48.85, I guess I should say 49.85 and 50.15. They have to run it, sorry about that, really tightly, close to 50. And here's why. If you were to run a 50.4 hertz in, so you start up a generator, someone's careless, and they've got it running at 50.4 hertz, push-pull instead of 50 push-pulls a, um, a second. The, that's what kind of electricity you get out of running those two frequencies together. You get electricity that within a second and a half has gone to zero volts. It's what I call lumpy electricity, not so good for your computer. And that took only a second and a half to get from 240 volts to zero. So it just shows that engineers are very stressed about keeping that frequency tight on 50. Um, yes, that's bad electricity and good is if we can keep it in. Oh, that's terrible. How did I let 48 get through there? I'm sorry. Um, this is a turbine in um, Shanghai. To give you some idea of why coal turbines are so good, but also applies to nuclear turbines and it applies to hydro, these turbines weigh about 600 tonnes. They spin at 3,600 revolutions per minute. So you've got 600 tonnes of metal turning 3,600 times a minute. That is spinning reserve. That is momentum and, it, as they call, system inertia. And it feeds into the grid. And when the grid falls, because too many people switched on their toasters all at once, this will speed up and it, it's kind of part of the grid. It's so well connected to the grid. You don't need a person standing there tinkering it responds to the drops in frequencies or the rises by speeding and slowing. So it's very stable when you've got these giant turbines. They are so big, they, um, 600 tonnes is like twice the weight of a kind of jet. So if you can imagine two jets spinning at 3,600, it's pretty silly, isn't it? Well, obviously you can't, but... Um, now, frequency, to keep it stable, we now have to pay money. We pay money to generators saying, can you help us with this stability, keeping the frequency close to 50? And you can see way back in 2009, we did not spend very much each week trying to keep the system stable. This year we've hit a record in the quarter, the last quarter there was uh, $73 million, I think, spent on frequency stability, paying generators to just keep that frequency close to 50. It's called Frequency Control Ancillary Services. Um, and to show you, and fragile, the South Australian system was fine, 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 and then fell over. In electrical terms, it all happens so quickly. We think of time as 4, 18 and 15 seconds, but in the world of electricity, it was actually falling over at 4, 18 and 15 seconds and 84 hundredths of a second. It's so quick, they have to keep track of the time to this kind of detail. And you see how fast it fell over, this is um, 47 for the frequency, you know, that engineers would have been doing a nana completely in the control room, but it was shut at that point, the interconnected to Victoria, because they were afraid of it cascading through the rest of the Australian national grid. And if they didn't load shed South Australia, the whole grid was going down. So, yes, we cut the South Australians off to save everyone else. Um, which, by the way, luckily resulted in no deaths except for some IVF embryos that defrosted which is a miracle because people were on operating tables and one of hospital's diesel gens didn't back up. So they were left in the dark on the operating table. People were trapped in planes because you need electricity to open the doors and move the things across and people were trapped in lifts and on cars and chaos. 1.6 million people in the dark. Solar is a river of money. I showed you this graph of just how much solar we're getting. It's just nuts in Australia. It's in Perth where I live and that two or three gigawatt grid We've hit one gigawatt in terms of the amount of solar at midday. So it's a really large part of our grid and they're now starting to worry that we are upsetting things. Up here in Broome, they have a very small grid. They've actually limited it. They've said no more than 10% of our, your production in Broome can be solar. So they've stopped people putting solar on roofs because more than 10% in a microgrid and the whole thing's at risk of falling over which makes people pretty grumpy up in Broome because they want to buy solar and they're not allowed to. First in, first serve and bad luck for the rest of you. <sighs> yes, that was the 10% point about Broome. Um, this is an interesting curve. 
This is the day, like midnight to midnight, that's lunchtime. Obviously solar works really well at lunchtime. So the normal load curve, you have peaks for breakfast and peaks for dinner. And then solar works really well when it's not breakfast or dinner. And um, it, each year, <laughs> yeah, each year as a solar kicks in, eating into what is basically a not a useful time zone, it chews down through this grid. This is Hawaii. Um, where they obviously get lots of sun. And this is known because this is, looks a bit like a head, a bit of a beak, a bit of a tail, call it a duck. So they do. Technically, it's called a duck curve. So when you hear the term the duck curve, they're talking about that solar transition eating through the day in the middle. That's California's duck curve. Very neat because it's very big. We're about the same population as California, by the way, just for perspective. Oh, yeah, that's a good graph. Sorry. This is, um, I'm sorry this is such a bad graph, but they're really hard to get these numbers. Um, this is solar. That big spike is solar energy in the middle of the day. These are prices, and you can see before and after solar kicks in, we're seeing what's ramping prices. As the system has to rapidly change to cope with the solar coming and going, the bidding prices are rising on each side of that solar coming and going. So solar's reducing the price in the middle of the day, but increasing it on the ramping high end as everything has to suddenly adjust to the solar coming and going. This is South Australia. You can see how much solar they have in the middle, and this is the price. So while solar's running hot, price is low. But notice, we're talking, I think, $50 a megawatt hour here. Remember, the whole Australian grid was running on $35 a megawatt hour for years. So even though solar is reducing the price in the middle of the day, it's still not cheaper than we used to get from our brown coal and black coal driven grid all those years. And this price dip here, where things go into the sort of fourth dimension, is wind. Apparently there was really a lot of wind that morning in Victoria and prices hit minus 44, where companies had to pay people to take their electricity because there was too much of it. I, Negative pricing is one of the features of a market like this, just comes and goes. Um, this is solar here, the people paying for solar, cents per kilowatt hour. These are people without solar and you can see the difference in each state. Those without solar are paying a much higher rate than those with solar because those with solar got a discounted system on the roof and they only use off-peak really prices mostly. So they're getting much cheaper electricity and they're bragging about their bills to everyone else, which is why the uptake of solar is so inexorable. Um, but the truth of the story is those without solar, they've cut their electricity use dramatically as the bills went up. Those with solar cut it to start with, but now those with solar have reached a crossover point where they're actually using more grid kilojoules uh, energy, kilowatts, um, they're using more energy than those without solar because those without solar can't afford to run the air conditioning anymore and those with solar can. It's very much the haves and the have-nots in Australia and so much for the theory that people putting solar on the roof would use less because they're not. This is in Queensland. Okay, and I've seen the future and the future is load shedding. <laughs> Another word for a blackout. <coughs> In Australia, we've got all kinds of things going on as they try and stop people using too much electricity in summer at peak demand. All very creative. They're paying people to turn things off. They're offering them movie tickets. They're giving them rewards and special deals and discounts off their exorbitant bills so that they use less. The smelters, of course, the aluminium smelters are on a hotline to be kicked off whenever they can at peak with that three hour limit knowing they're going to need that electricity before it's been off too long. Yes, movie tickets. People go to the cinema. <sighs> yes, it's a modern country. Um, what do you call it when your electricity grid doesn't have enough energy? In Queensland, it's a peak smart event. <laughs> I, I'm not making this up. Orwell would be so proud. And you can manage that with a peak smart air conditioner, which is one the government, I mean, not the government, the, the companies generators have control of a little chip in and they will switch your air conditioner down at peak times which are usually really hot times exactly when you want to use your air conditioner and people put up with this because they get a discount for buying an air conditioner sort of they figure well I'll get a discount it's only a couple of days a year when I can't but the idea of the government or someone controlling my air conditioner is just like Apparently the tradies say there's a big demand for people to switch those chips off and presumably then they have to go back to the um, more expensive scheme. 
Oh yes, demand management just means a million small blackouts and people are being paid to switch off. And oh yes, I thought I'm near the end. I thought I'd finish with coal. This is China and the turbines in China. 167 there, 83 there, 66 turbines. That's those numbers in the boxes, just how many turbines they have. And compared to Australia, oh, sorry, I forgot, India, which is growing, of course, nowhere near China's level, but 300 million people still to be connected. That's Australia's coal. That's right. That's, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to control the global climate by slowing and shutting these coal plants. Yeah. We compete well with Africa. Good to know. Um, Niger in Africa has a population, I think, 30 million people or something, and it, it uses about the same electricity as Dubbo in New South Wales, which has 40,000 people. It says something about how desperately Africans need to get. I'm just going to briefly say, what's the cost of complexity? When we have these systems, I need to now read my electricity bills, think through, think through the offers, or well, actually not in WA because we can only buy electricity from the government. But in the rest of Australia, they're spending hours going through these things and trying to figure them out. And you know, instead of playing with their kids or reading books to their children, they're trying to figure out if they run the pool pump on 18 hours a day but not the key six hours, whether that'll help, whether they need an air conditioner that the company controls and not them and all this kind of stuff. I just think it's a real eating into our quality of life to have to spend so long trying to figure these things out. Now, step six, because there was no step five, I don't know if you noticed, but... I'm just keeping in with renewables, who needs numbers? Um, <laughs> step six is really important, it's the last step. You've got to stop people from asking questions and the way to do that is to call them names because name calling works and if you're a bully, people will stand silent and sit tight because they don't want to look stupid and it works really well and it's a damn shame. So we need to spread the word, get the message out. We've got to stand up and it's not science, it's just bullying. And, um, oh, well, maybe we can talk about these people in questions. Lastly, Australian voters, here they are, strongly opposed to adopting measures to curb CO2 emissions and strongly supporting. Here's the empty centre, ladies and gentlemen. People are not in the middle because this is not a normal debate. If the media was discussing what it costs and the benefits and things, the population would be a bell curve. Small on the strongly opposed and strongly for, and there'd be a discussion and a peak here. Right now, this is the empty vacant area and that's exactly where our Conservatives are aiming to win in the next election. Yeah, all the voters that aren't in there, that's why they're doing so well. Okay, oh, and cool futures, maybe you want to ask me, we decided to do a hedge fund, hopefully, to make some money out of the misallocation of funds and my website. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, it's good to be here.